Hello and welcome to the Commander's Quarters. I'm your host, Mitch. Glad to have you here. If this is your first time, let me give you a quick rundown on what we're all about. Here at the Commander's Quarters, we build fun and inexpensive focused Commander decks. A focused Commander deck is more attuned than a casual deck, but not quite to the level of a competitive or optimized deck. Today's episode is going to be a special one, though, where we exclude the cost of the Commander. With just a $25 budget, it's pretty much impossible to build around some Commanders unless we do so. Sometimes you get lucky and open up a Commander in a pack, or you could just trade for them if you really want to build around them. So our budget is still going to be $25, but again, that's $25 for just 99 cards because we're excluding the cost of that commander. And prices on this show are powered by our sponsor, TCG Player. Before we get started today, though, make sure you go check out our new classic pink playmat and Commander's Quarters t-shirts on thecommandersquarters.com. And thank you to everyone who's already purchased our merchandise. It really does help support the channel. Also, make sure that you subscribe to the channel and click that little bell notification icon so that you can stay up to date on the latest Commander's Quarters episodes. Today's commander is Kamal Fist of Krosa. Kamal is a 4-3 human druid that costs 4 green green. He has pay a green, target land becomes a 1-1 creature until end of turn, it's still a land. And 2 green green green, creatures you control get plus 3 plus 3 and gain trample until end of turn. Now on its face, Kamal seems like a very straightforward commander. By generating a ton of mana, you can make a lot of your lands into creatures, pump them, and swing out. But we're going to take this commander in a different direction, one that green isn't really known for. And that direction is mass land destruction. For just 1 green mana, we can turn any of our opponent's lands into a creature, making it much more vulnerable to being destroyed. Now we don't want our opponents to know that we're going this direction because then we're going to become a huge target. So we want to play our deck like we're just ramping so that we can stomp our opponents with our creatures. Luckily for us, Kamal really protects our creatures very well. With Kamal on the board and mana open, it's going to be nearly impossible for our opponents to justify casting a Wrath. Because if they do cast something that destroys all creatures, we're going to turn all their lands into creatures too. Even without them casting a Wrath though, we've got plenty of ways to destroy all their lands on our own. So what's our strategy with this deck? Well, we want to ramp at an incredible speed so that we can get set up. The more mana that we generate, the more lands that we can turn into creatures and protect our own board. And then how do we win with this deck? Well, we're going to smash our opponents and destroy all their lands. Green isn't known for damage spells, but we've still got some ways that we can destroy our opponent's lands once they become creatures. And even if we don't draw into any of those cards, we can still easily overwhelm our opponents with our giant army. As with all Commander's Quarters decks, I'm going to break this deck down into 10 different tactics that show you how the deck works and how you're going to win with it. So let's start with our first tactic. Tactic number one, Rivendell. First up, there's Arbor Elf, which we can tap to untap target forest. Turn one plays that immediately ramp us are great. But Arbor Elf can be even better than that because we've got some cards in this deck that are going to make our forest generate more than one mana. Next up, we're running Elvish Mystic and Llanowar Elves, both of which are the exact same. They're going to tap for a green. Again, this deck needs as much ramp as it can get, so turn one plays are huge. Next up, we've got some elves that cost two and tap for a green with Wirewood Elf, Leaf Glider, and Druid of the Cow. As you may have noticed so far, every single one of these creatures is an elf, which does come in handy with some of the cards that we'll mention later. So we're also going to be running Elfame Druid, Quirion Elves, and Heart Warden, each of which pretty much just tap for a green. Heart Warden does have the upside that we can pay two and sacrifice it to draw a card if we ever need to. Next up is Quirion Explorer, which can tap for one mana of any color that a land and opponent controls could produce. So generally this can tap for a green mana, but even if it doesn't, it still ramps us. And finally there's Wood Elves, which when it enters the battlefield, we get to search our library for a forest and put it onto the battlefield, then shuffle our library. All these elves are very cheap and can help us ramp very quickly. But we've got some other kinds of creatures that can help us ramp too. Let's go through them now in tactic number two, Island of Misfit Dorks. First up there's Plague Mirror, which taps for a colorless and it has Infect. Now while we do prefer our mana dorks to tap for a green, we do make exceptions. Since Plague Mirror has Infect, it can be a huge threat to our opponents, especially with our commander's ability to pump it. And then we're also going to be running Magus of the Library, which also only taps for a colorless, but it does have some additional utility too. We can tap it to draw a card if we have exactly 7 cards in our hand. We've got some ways in this deck to draw a ton of cards so we can easily get back up to 7. So having this little piece of utility is just a nice addition in order to help us dig one deeper. Next up is Copper Mirror, which is an artifact creature that taps for a green. And then we've got Harvester Druid and Naga Vitalist, both of which essentially tap for a green in this deck. And then there's Silvok Explorer, which can usually tap for a green depending on our opponent's land situation. Next up are some more mana dorks that tap for a green with Orochi Sustainer, Golden Hide, and Werebear. Although we aren't counting on it, Werebear can get plus 3 plus 3 if we have 7 or more cards in our graveyard. And finally, we're going to be running Voyaging Seder, which can tap to untap target land. Much like Arbor Elf, this is just going to generate 1 mana for us early, but it can generate more later. But Voyaging Seder isn't the only creature in this deck that can generate more than 1 mana. So let's go through some more that can in tactic number 3, One with the Earth. First up there's Whisper of the Wilds, which only starts off as tapping for a green, but it can tap for 2 green if we control a creature with power 4 or greater. And luckily for us, our commander has exactly 4 power. Then there's Scorn Villager, which also starts off as only tapping for a green, but it also has, at the beginning of each upkeep, if no spells were cast last turn, transform it. It transforms into Moonscarred Werewolf, which has Vigilance and can tap for 2 green. Both of these are fantastic turn 2 plays that can generate us a ton of value. Next up we've got some Mana Dorks that cost 3 and tap for 2 with Palladium Mirror and Antuco Elder. Palladium is going to tap for 2 colorless, and Antuco Elder is going to tap for a colorless and a green. And then we've got some creatures that cost 3 and tap for 2 green with Finehorn Elder and Green Weaver Druid. 
Again, whenever possible, we want our creatures to tap for a green so that we can fully utilize Kamal's ability with all of our mana. Next up, we've got three creatures that just start off tapping for a green, but can end up tapping for a ton more. Viridian Joiner can tap to add an amount of green mana to our mana pool equal to its power. So if we're using Kamal's ability to pump up our creatures, Viridian Joiner is going to benefit from that. And then Marwyn the Nurturer does the exact same thing, but it does it even better. It also has, whenever an elf enters the battlefield under your control, put a plus one plus one counter on Marwyn the Nurturer. So every single time we play an elf, we're basically going to net ourselves an extra mana. Then there's Elvish Archdruid, which is going to tap to add green for each elf that we control, and other elf creatures we control get plus one plus one. So this card synergizes very well with both Viridian Joiner and Marwyn the Nurturer. And finally, we're going to be running Karametra's Acolyte, which can easily generate the most mana out of all of our mana dorks. She has tap to add an amount of green to your mana pool equal to your devotion to green. And as this is a mono green deck, our devotion to green can get really high. Now tapping any of these mana dorks that generate a ton of mana once in a turn is great, but doing it twice is even better. So let's go through some ways to do that in tactic number four. Now do it again. First up, we're going to be running Seeker of Skybreak, which can tap to untap target creature. Now, while Seeker of Skybreak can't produce any mana on its own, it can be very impactful for us. We are running a ton of mana dorks in this deck, so the vast majority of the time, we're going to be able to use it to untap one of them. And if we've got something like Karametra's Acolyte on the battlefield, this card can be invaluable. Because there are plenty of times that Karametra's Acolyte can tap for upwards of 10 mana, so being able to tap her twice is insane. But perhaps an even more powerful effect comes from Copperhorn Scout. Because whenever it attacks, we get to untap each other creature that we control. Essentially, this doubles up the amount of mana that all of our mana dorks can produce in a turn. And if we've got our commander on the board, it can make it very difficult for our opponents to decide to actually block Copperhorn Scout because we can just pump it if we need to. But mana dorks aren't the only way that we're going to ramp in this deck. So let's go through some of our other ways to ramp in tactic number 5, Greater Greenery. First up, there's Ronus's Monument, which serves a dual purpose in this deck. First off, it makes it so green creature spells that we cast cost one less to cast. And then whenever we cast a creature spell, target creature we control gets plus two plus two and gains trample until the end of the turn. So not only can this card help us cast our creature spells quicker, but it can also pump some key creatures too. And then we're going to be running Frontier Siege, and when it comes into play, we're going to choose cons. So at the beginning of each of our main phases, we get to add green green to our mana pool. Over the course of a game, this card generates a ton of mana for us. Essentially, it pays for itself in just a turn and a half, and then it nets us even more mana. And finally, there's Keeper Progenitus, which can really speed up our ramp. Keeper Progenitus says whenever a player taps a Mountain, Forest, or Plains for mana, that player adds one mana to their mana pool of any type that land produced. And we're only running Basic Forest in this deck, so we're really going to benefit from this. So after we're set up and have a ton of mana, what's the next part of the plan? Let's go through it now in tactic number six, land a blow. First up there's Cetus and Tactics, which has, until the end of the turn, any number of target creatures each gets plus one plus one and gain, tap, this creature fights another target creature. It has a strive cost of green, so we can just pay green for each additional target that we want. So the plan with this card is to get Kamal in play, as well as a ton of other creatures. We turn some of our opponent's lands into creatures, cast this to target our own creatures, and then have them fight those lands. This is a fantastic spell because we can do it at instant speed, so it can come out of nowhere. And then we're going to be running Goblin Cannon and Rocket Launcher, both of which are pretty much the same thing. We can pay 2 to have them deal 1 damage to any target, but then we have to sacrifice them. The only difference is that we can't use Rocket Launcher on the turn that it comes out, and Rocket Launcher isn't sacrificed until the end of the turn. And although Goblin Cannon says it's going to be sacrificed right away, we can actually respond to it to do it multiple times. Essentially though, with one of these in play in our commander, we can pay 3 mana to destroy any land. And with the amount of mana that we can produce with this deck, we can easily destroy at least 1 player's lands, if not 2. Next up is Triskelion, which is going to enter the battlefield with 3 plus 1 plus 1 counters on it. And then at any time, we can remove one of those plus 1 plus 1 counters to deal 1 damage to any target. So although this card is limited, it can still destroy 3 lands very quickly. And then there's Pelucranos World Eater, which has Monstrosity for XX and a green. When it becomes monstrous, it's going to deal X damage divided as we choose among any number of target creatures our opponents control. Each of those creatures deals damage equal to its power to Pelucranos. With our commander in play, essentially after we pay that first green mana, it's going to cost us 3 mana to destroy any land. Next, we're going to be running Mastacore, which has at the beginning of your upkeep, sacrifice it unless you discard a card. And pay 2, Mastacore deals 1 damage to target creature, and pay 2, regenerate Mastacore. This is an incredible repeatable effect that when we have our commander and Mastacore on the battlefield, we can just pay 3 mana at any time to destroy land. This does require a little planning ahead because we do have to discard a card each turn to keep it alive, but that's a small price to pay. And then we're going to be running Cyclone, which says at the beginning of your upkeep, put a win counter on Cyclone, then sacrifice Cyclone unless you pay green for each win counter on it. If you pay, Cyclone deals damage equal to the number of wind counters on it to each creature and each player. This is a very strange effect for green, but it can be a massive land destruction spell for us. So after we play this card on our next upkeep, essentially our plan is going to be to turn as many of our opponent's lands into creatures, and then just pay one for a Cyclone to destroy them all. Now this may destroy some of our mana dorks in the process, but that is a small price to pay. 
And then Time Bomb is very similar. It has at the beginning of your upkeep put a time counter on Time Bomb. And then we can pay one to tap and sacrifice it to deal damage equal to the number of time counters on it to each creature and each player. So if possible, we want to get both of these cards out on the turn before we're trying to destroy all of our opponent's lands. That way, at least some of our mana dorks will be saved if they have a toughness greater than one. But next up, we've got Nevin Rawls Disc, which is a more all-in play. It enters the battlefield tapped, and we can pay one to tap it to destroy all artifacts, creatures, and enchantments. So with this and our commander in play, we can basically destroy all of our opponent's lands pretty easily. The downside is that we're also going to be destroying our board, but our lands are going to be safe. So generally what we want to do with this is to hold this over our opponent's heads to make sure that they know that we can destroy their lands at any time. Essentially, we're going to be holding our opponents hostage while we build up our hand or find another threat. And the threat that we're most hoping to find is our golden pick of the deck, which is the number one card out of our 99. And the golden pick for this deck is Powder Keg. Powder Keg is an artifact that costs two, and it says at the beginning of your upkeep, you may put a Fuse Counter on Powder Keg. You can tap and sacrifice Powder Keg to destroy each artifact and creature with converted mana cost equal to the number of Fuse Counters on Powder Keg. This card is quite literally a bomb in this deck. Lands have a converted mana cost of zero. And when we turn our opponent's lands into creatures, they're going to be creatures that have a converted mana cost of zero. So if we never put a Fuse Counter on Powder Keg and we tap and sacrifice it, it's going to destroy each creature that has a converted mana cost of zero. This card essentially allows us to dump as much mana as we want to into turn all of our opponent's lands into creatures. We can either do this on the turn that we play Powder Keg, or if we want one more turn to set up and get that extra two mana back, we can actually just do it on the next turn. This is the most efficient way of destroying all of our opponent's lands at once, and it keeps our own creatures alive. And that's what makes it the Golden Pig. Lands won't be the only things that we destroy though. So let's go through some more ways to destroy things in tactic number seven, if you break it. First up, there's Reclamation Sage, which when it enters the battlefield, we get to destroy target artifact or enchantment. This is a fantastic effect to have on a body because again, with our commander, we can pump it if we need to. Not only does this provide us with a lot of utility, but this tiny creature can become a huge threat later on in the game. And then we've got Terastodon, which is a not so tiny creature. It's a 9-9, and when it enters the battlefield, we can destroy up to three target non-creature permanents. For each permanent put into a graveyard this way, its controller creates a 3-3 green elephant creature token. So this can help us deal with artifacts, enchantments, and planeswalkers, but it can even help us deal with lands. For this deck's purposes, this card can essentially read, destroy three target lands. This deck can ramp so quickly that we can cast this card as early as turn four. If we can cast it early enough, we can essentially knock one of our opponents completely out of the game. Also, since it's a creature, green has plenty of great ways to tutor for it. Let's go through some of those ways in tactic number eight, go find it. First up, there's Fierce Empath, and when it enters the battlefield, we can search our library for a creature card with converted mana cost six or greater, reveal it, put it into our hand, then shuffle our library. This is a great cheap way for us to go get either Terastodon or one of our other big creatures that we need. And then we're going to be running Uncage the Menagerie, which has search your library for up to X creature cards with different names that each have a converted mana cost X, reveal them, put them into your hand, then shuffle your library. While this might not be the most efficient tutor for this deck, it still gets the job done. For example, if X equals 4, we can go get 4 creatures that have a converted mana cost of 4. Then we can go get Karametra's Acolyte and Keeper Progenitus to help us ramp even further. And we can also get Mastacor and Pelucranos to start blowing up lands. Next up is Weird Harvest, which lets every player search for X creature cards and put them into their hand. We can go get the perfect cards for the situation to help us ramp further and destroy all of our opponent's lands. And finally, we're going to be running Skyship Weatherlight, which says when it enters the battlefield, search your library for any number of artifact and or creature cards and exile them, then shuffle your library. We can then pay 4 to tap it to choose a card at random that was exiled with it to put it into our hand. This is a very high risk, high reward play though. While this card allows us to go get something like Powder Keg, it also leaves it very vulnerable since it's in exile. Because if Skyship Weatherlight is destroyed, Powder Keg is just going to stay in exile for the rest of the game. So we need to be very cautious with when we cast this and when we use it. But tutoring isn't the only way that we can get to our threats. Let's go through some more ways to do it in tactic number 9, Thinking Deep. First up there's Harmonize, which is just a great draw spell. It's going to cost us 4 and we get to draw 3. And then we're going to be running Lore Seeker Stone, which we can pay 3 to tap it and draw 3 cards, but that ability is going to cost us 1 more to activate for each card in our hand. This deck is very good at dumping its hand onto the field though, so we can usually activate this for 3 or just a little more. Next up we've got 3 draw spells that deal with the number of creatures that we have on the board. Both Shamanic Revelation and Collective Unconscious will let us draw a card for each creature that we control. On top of that, Shamanic Revelation is going to gain us 4 life for each creature that we control with power 4 or greater. And then there's Regal Force, which is going to draw us a card for each green creature that we control. We are running a ton of creatures in this deck, and the vast majority are green, so each of these spells is going to draw us a ton of cards. And finally, we've got two cards that essentially draw us a card every single time one of our creatures enters the battlefield. Guardian Project says, whenever a non-token creature enters the battlefield under your control, if it doesn't have the same name as another creature you control or a creature card in your graveyard, draw a card. And since this is Commander, we don't have any duplicates of our cards. And then Soul of the Harvest just straight up says, whenever another non-token creature enters the battlefield under your control, you may draw a card. If we can get either of these down early, they're going to net us a ton of cards. What happens though if we've already used one of our best cards or if it just straight up gets destroyed? Let's go through some ways to get them back in tactic number 10, I seem to recall. First up is Recollect, which is going to let us return target card from our graveyard to our hand. And then we're going to be running Reap, which says return up to X target cards from your graveyard to your hand, where X is the number of black permanents target opponent controls as you cast this spell. 
Since we're playing with three opponents, the odds are in our favor that at least one of our opponents is going to have a black permanent. And there are plenty of times that there are going to be multiple black permanents on the board. So this card can provide us with an incredible amount of value for only two mana at instant speed. Next up, we've got Restock and Seeds of Renewal, which will always bring us back two cards. On top of that, Seeds of Renewal has Undaunted, so it's usually only going to cost us four mana. And then there's Wildest Dreams, which is going to let us return X target cards from our graveyard to our hand. This deck excels at producing a ton of mana, so we can get a lot of cards back with this. And finally, there's Creeping Renaissance, which can also get us back a ton of cards at once. It says choose a permanent type, return all cards of the chosen type from your graveyard to your hand, and we can flash it back for five green green. The most important cards in this deck are all permanent, so we can really make use of this. This deck is a ton of fun, and it can take over the game out of nowhere. But now that we've gone through the cards that help us win with this deck, let's go through the cards that help make it happen. It's time to go on to the mana base. The mana base in this deck is very straightforward. We're going to be running 34 lands, and every single one of them is going to be a forest. And now that we've gone through every single card in this deck, let's do a quick price check. A quick reminder that our deck costs are calculated using TCG player optimization, optimizing with even heavily played and damaged cards because those cards need a home too. The average Kamal Fist of Krosa EDH rec deck is going to set you back $561.22, so let's see if we compare to that. Our deck is going to be much more affordable, coming in at just $24.95. And just a quick reminder that our deck cost actually doesn't include our commander because it is a commander excluded episode. Again, Commander's Quarters decks are built to be tuned and focused within their budget, but there are always ways that we can improve on them. So let's go through some reasonable upgrades that you can add into the deck, and what I would take out for those cards too. Just a quick disclaimer before we get into this, these reasonable upgrades are going to be completely based off of my own perspective. When you're making choices on how to adjust your deck, you're taking your own playstyle and meta into account. So make sure that you factor that in when it comes to making your own decisions on what to swap in and what to swap out. Now that we're on the same page, let's go through how I personally would upgrade the deck. First up, we're going to be adding in Priest of Titania, which comes in at $3.64. It's a 1-1 Elf Druid that costs 1 and a green, and it can tap to add green to your mana pool for each Elf on the battlefield. To put Priest of Titania in the deck, we're going to be taking out Copper Mirror. At minimum, Priest of Titania can tap for the exact same amount as Copper Mirror, but most of the time she's going to be tapping for a lot more just because we're running so many Elves in this deck. Another card that we're going to upgrade this deck with is Wirewood Channeler, which comes in at $1.62. It's a 2-2 Elf that costs 3 and a green, and it can tap to add X mana of any one color to our mana pool where X is the number of elves in play. To put Wirewood Channeler in, we're going to take out Silvok Explorer. Although Wirewood Channeler does cost two more than Silvok Explorer, again, the upside of being able to tap for a ton of mana is huge. Next up, we're going to add Invernal Bloom, which comes in at $2.95. It's an enchantment that costs three and a green, and it says whenever a forest is tapped for mana, its controller adds green to their mana pool. To put Vernal Bloom in, we're going to take out Viridian Joiner. Vernal Bloom is just going to have an immediate impact, basically doubling up all of our lands. Whereas Viridian Joiner can be really dependent on us pumping it to actually get some extra value out of it. And then we're going to be upgrading this deck by adding in Lightning Greaves, which comes in at $7. It's an equipment that costs two and it costs zero to equip and it says equip creature has haste and shroud. To put Lightning Greaves in, we're going to be taking out Ronus's Monument. Lightning Greaves can have an immediate impact by essentially giving all of our man dorks haste. And on top of that, we can use it to protect our commander by giving him Shroud. Ronus's Monument can just be a bit too slow sometimes in order to actually make an impact. So it's not too hard of a decision for us to make because Lightning Greaves can just be much more effective in this deck. Next up, we're going to be upgrading this deck with Ring of Three Wishes, which comes in at $1.95. Ring of Three Wishes is an artifact that costs five and it's going to enter the battlefield with three wish counters on it. We can pay five to tap and remove a wish counter from it to search our library for any card and put it into our hand. To fit Ring of Three Wishes into the deck, we're going to be taking out Rocket Launcher. Ring of Three Wishes is a fantastic tutor that can go get three of our best cards. With this deck, we are more than willing to pay the mana to go get something like Powder Keg. And Rocket Launcher is probably our least effective form of land removal. It can be very telegraphed since we can't actually use it on the turn that it comes down. And finally, we're going to be adding in Beast Whisperer, which comes in at $2.91. Beast Whisperer is a 2-3 Elf Druid that costs 2 green green. It says whenever you cast a creature spell, draw a card. To put Beast Whisperer in, we're going to be taking out Soul of the Harvest. For all purposes of this deck, Beast Whisperer is just a cheaper version of Soul of the Harvest. And on top of that, it's also an Elf which comes into play with some of our cards. For this deck's purposes, Beast Whisperer is just pretty much better in every single way, and so it's an easy swap. And with that, our show is coming to a close, but I really just want to hear about what you think about this deck, so why don't you let me know in the comments below. When you're buying decks like this one, or just individual cards, make sure you use that decklist link in the description below. Not only will you be getting great prices on TCG Player, but you're also going to be supporting this show because they sponsor us. And make sure that you follow us on social media so you can get some early hints on who the next commander just might be. Links to our social media accounts can be found in the description. Also in the description below is a link to the Commander's Quarters Patreon page, and I just want to say a quick thank you to the patrons who have subscribed so far. There are many benefits to being a patron for the Commander's Quarters, including being able to vote on future commanders for deck tax. There's even a general level tier where you get your own personalized deck tech dedicated to you. I truly couldn't do this without all of your support, so from the bottom of my heart, thank you. If you haven't already, make sure that you like and subscribe to the channel, and then check out some of our playlists on budget commander decks, commander-excluded decks, and break-the-bank episodes. And with that, I'm out of here. Thanks again, and have a good one.